Hey, welcome everybody. Good evening. And I uh, hope this will be as exciting for me as it will be for you and my daughter, who I need right now to help me go through this. Um, we're going to look at the issues and some um, notes surrounding training, cue reading, decision making uh, when it comes to practicing um, and training your athletes. So I'll just go start from the beginning. Um, Volleyball Canada has come up with a uh, performance triangle that they've been trying to get across to all the coaches in the, in the country through the NCCP courses and through any sort of uh, stuff they send out. And getting from the very beginning, whether the kids are 11 or 18, to get coaches to be uh, confident and comfortable teaching athletes how to read instead of just saying learn to read, give, giving them strategies to learn how to read. Uh, what's going on, and then it, the ability to make a good decision and make it quickly, and then the ability to execute. So the, I'll probably deal with the uh, the first two, the most part, the reading and the decision making, and very little on the actual skills and techniques, but just uh, the ability that might be concerned with that. Uh, this all started a while ago for me. Um, having nothing to do some evenings, sitting down with a glass of wine, and I came across this article uh, a while ago. Uh, and that's when I was starting to get interested in, in how uh, some people can see what's going on way quicker and way clearer than a lot of people involved in, in actually participating. So they presented uh, a random chessboard to people like me, the average Joe, and to me, it would have looked just like a bunch of pieces and horses' heads, they call them. And then they showed it to a grandmaster, which is the second one. And to him, it looked the same, a bunch of squares and a bunch of horses' heads with no pattern. Then they put the chessboard into a game situation of actually playing through some moves. And to me, again, it looked really similar to the first one. Uh, I had no idea what's going on. But when they showed it to the grandmaster, right away, he was instantly able to process the next moves and try and get ahead of what was going on the board. So that sort of triggered me to, to start going around looking for uh, ways to get the kids to be able to read and, and do that. Um, one of the things though, volleyball is not like chess. Um, it's really similar to other sort of court games and field games like soccer and basketball where the athletes are in the middle of a live video game. So this is what they're looking at and having to work with. We're looking at the, the team in yellow, Brazilian women, just because they're the closest to the camera. We're looking at the number of decisions that they're making relative to the ball and the contacts and, and how they come up with that. So this is what we're trying to get our game to look like, whether it's, again, 11-year-old or 18 or university. There should be some flow and there should be some awareness of what's going on so you can make a good decision. And then coaches can train the athletes to have the skills to execute that. But the biggest thing comes from reading first and then trying to make a decision what to happen a certain thing. Uh, I worked with Ryan Hofer a couple of years ago with the youth national team and um, he's the head coach at Trinity Western Women. He put together uh, a, a structure for his training based on where his team scores points. So at 12, 13, you attacking is a really low priority um, for him serving was a low priority. Hopefully it goes in, but attacking was very high. So it just, what, it, what I'm getting at is you should know where your points are coming from at what age group you're at. So that would lead you to figure out where your training would go and what to pay attention to. If you look at his stats at the bottom of the, on the black uh, part here, so Trinity Western is in white, opponents are in red. So he scored 12 and a half points Per set, opponents holding the opponents to 10. 
and you got two and a half aces per set, holding the opponents to under two. So right there, just with serving attacking, he's at 15 something. And he had to figure out a way to get the other 10. Um, the Brazilian coaches coach, they try and come up with strategies to get to 22, 23, um, not 25. And they figure they can steal the last two uh, if they get that far. So one of the first things we look at is um, cue reading. Um, we tried to put together something. Uh, this is a slide I stole from John Kessel from the U.S. He was doing a presentation with U.S. Hockey. Um, and between Volleyball USA and USA Hockey, they were trying to figure out what would be the two most important skills that they should train across all age groups. Um, with the underlying premise that they're training to learn. So his um, slide that he put in, this poor athlete getting hit in the face, um, you're not losing that point, you're learning. Um, so here we get to the some of the scientific stuff. Uh, one of the things you have to remember about peer reading is that there's a lot of stuff happening as we saw in the, in the video. And it's broken down into two basic uh, types. One is contextual, which is basically all the surrounding stuff. And the other one is kinematic, which is everything that involves from the ball strike, uh, slightly surrounding it, and laid after that. So contextual, what are some things? So I list them there for you, won't go through them all, but it's really picking up the cues of what's happening, because all of this stuff will affect the athlete's status at that point in time to be able to um, figure out what decision to make and what to execute. If they don't have an understanding how to, to look at this stuff, if you don't train them in your practices to look at this stuff and make some clear uh, assessments and deliberations about it, um, they're going to be a little bit further behind when it comes to actually uh, performing well. So one of the bottom quote um, from a study that was done is that when they, when they trained, they tested skilled tennis players. They found that they tended to watch the cues that came from the proximal body, which is basically the trunk and the shoulder and the hips. And the lesser skilled people uh, were focusing on the racket, uh, which is way too late. So the things that we look under the kinematic sense um, is, the, let's say you're looking at serving, so you're looking at the uh, server moving to the ball, the contact, the trajectory, where my players are going, uh, who's passing the ball, what am I doing, am I in balance, am I, am I helping out? Those are all the kinematic types of things that I have to read uh, to, to go in and feed information into making my decision. So if you look at service receive passing, um, contextual cues that you could throw at the, the passer to look at before they pass throw things like, you know, 23, 24 on the scoreboard and their pass has to be perfect, obviously, or else it goes to game, to set. Um, playing random noise, crowd noise, uh, loud rock and roll stuff. Um, this thing up here, if you can see count down to eight, I've been experimenting with passing and as the passers are watching the server, the moment the server shows a posture, the passer starts counting backwards from eight to one, which is the eight seconds of the serve time. And they have to keep counting while they're passing the ball. And we can throw other things in there, but like left and right and mine and that, that kind of stuff, but they have to keep counting down to one. Um, so we'll get, we'll get into that later. Um, anxiety, excitement also affects how a player is going to be able to read what's going on, whether they get distracted or what they're worried about. So part of this contextual stuff can be done describing. Um, you can run some run a drill, watch a video, and have the players um, 
describe either verbally or or written just what's going on and what they see. And on the kinematic side, um, verbalize means that the athlete would actually have to say spin float on the serve toss before the server strikes the ball. And on the serve contact or shortly after, they would have to say left or right. So that means they would be assessing which side of their body that the serve would be going to. As you get more experience, it could call short deep. Uh, but we found out lately that uh, people decide the trajectory. It's easier for them to assess the short deep rather than the person that's passing, because they're almost the last person that can react to that. But they're verbalizing stuff that they see happening and, and what they want to happen. Um, so I'm going to ramble on. If there's questions, you can think you can send them. So rather than boring stats, we're looking at this. Um, so this would be like somewhat interactive. So this is for setting or blocking. Where will the set go and why? So having said all that in that previous slide, what are some contextual things that you see in this slide? It's a one-off screenshot slide. Uh, I think you can send uh, little notes on the side there and see. So anything con contextual that you see. And as some of you may know, and have been stuff with me, you know, I rarely give the answer. Um, so this has to be somewhat interactive or else it doesn't work. Uh, anything works here from a contextual point of view. No. Are you seeing the messages? No. Mm, I've got questions. I don't have messages. And ah, where's the ball? Ah, there's a good one. If you look at it, the ball is just almost in her hands. It's right there above the, the girl that's setting. Not sure. Player movement. Player movement is uh, kinematic, so we're going to leave that one for a second. We're looking at for contextual things, things that are ha happening or not happening, but are in the surrounding, no middle attacker. Uh, awesome. Okay, so the context here is we have an outside hitter. So she has four attackers, outside pipe, possible pipe, a right side and a C ball backcourt. The other, I'll just I'll quickly go through what I'm looking at. If we get get one more in there, anything else? Left side blocker is already committed. Awesome. So those are real contextual things of what's happening on this frame shot. So start looking at some other things now. In the background, you can see London 2012. So this is an Olympic match. That is a huge stage to be playing on. Over here, you can see a TV camera right on the edge of the player box and uh, three, three meter line hanging over what's going on. You can see these dark patches in, in the crowd and, and the crowd in the background. Uh, you can see the scores flickering in the background. Um, you can see the people back there keeping stats on the match. Another camera right in front of them hanging over the back part of the court. Uh, but 2012 Olympics is a huge stage. So from a contextual point of view, their anxiety levels might be a little bit different than if they were just training. So from a kinematic point of view, yeah, the left side's moving already. She is committed. 
she is almost committed. She might be too close to hit C ball. Uh, like I said, it's a slide. Um, but it is a one-off still shot. And the actual set she made was a pipe set to this girl coming in here. So the ball is just, just almost touching her hands and this block released. Whether she felt that or saw that or knew it, um, she made a good choice setting here, one against one in the middle. This blocker looks like they're not ready to do anything. Um, so that's what you're looking at, getting your athletes to, to figure out. When it comes time, um, when it comes time to attacking, so previous game dynamics, uh, your level of anxiety again, whether the score is 24 all or 0 0, maybe the you have to work with your athletes to control that um, scoreboard, what your game plan is. Um, that's always in the back of the mind. Uh, the higher you get, the higher levels you play at. Um, and maybe they have to verbalize tempo when they're learning to make sure they're on the same page as everybody else. Then the, where's the pass? Where is it going? Where's the setter? What kind of set am I getting? That kind of stuff. So what you've got to be able to do is separate some of the contextual stuff and train that because that's almost like the fun stuff, playing, playing music and doing things like that. And I don't know why they're static only. Sorry, um, Melissa. LP said it was okay. Let me. Uh, uh, is that any better? Melissa, does that sound better? So vision training is another huge um, training event that's come along in the, in the last few years. Some of it is can do video analysis of team player individuals. Um, the fun one is sort of dealing like what we did with the last one, have the positive video, have them describe what the act might be and then uh, and why, uh, and then see if they were right when the video starts. Um, peripheral vision training is huge for setters and attackers. Um, visual occlusion um, is another one that, that has come along that some of the elite athletes are uh, outstanding about what they can do with their anticipation skills. So they just threw together a very simple uh, blocking drill, um, tossing the ball to the setter, blockers close their eyes when the ball's almost in the hands, and then while their eyes are closed, they have to verbalize where they think the set is going and then open their eyes and see if they were right or not. And then be able to sort of um, say, uh, this is why I thought they were going to set them. So the, the YouTube uh, link, I don't know if it linked or not, but the, the address on the bottom, and this is only about a minute or so long couple minutes. So you can read the, the preamble on the side and you can show what people are doing with occlusion testing. So they turned the lights off on Ronaldo just prior to the, the researcher striking the ball um, across the, the pitch in front of the net. And I don't know if you can hear his explanation, but uh, what he's saying is that he saw him basically leaning back and saw his foot going slightly on the ball and he was going to go a certain distance and a certain height, and then he thought he was going to head it, but then he realized he probably would try the shoulder instead. 
all this while the ball's still in the air. Uh, lots of people have been successful doing that kind of stuff on video, doing video analysis and, and guessing the right location and stuff. But somebody like this who can actually do it uh, in real life is, is quite an exceptional um, athlete to be able to do that. So that's the early part of, um, of cue reading or picking up stuff um, and trying to make a good decision. Uh, my favorite comic when uh, our kids were growing up. And this part here from young Calvin will, um, will get shown up a little bit later on when we go through this. So the couple of um, different types of uh, learning and training that, that people are experimenting with. Uh, implicit, which is a longer uh, learning process. Um, is usually um, intrinsic in the fact that the information is coming from the athlete and its surroundings and not from the coach. The explicit one is what most of us are probably used to is that when we give all the information to the athlete, uh, thumbs together, uh, arms straight, um, 45 degrees to the ground, uh, base of support, you know, 1.3 meters apart, that kind of stuff. Uh, this experiment with Matthews and Buss, um, what they did is they did some implicit training first, followed by explicit processes. And they found that that hybrid actually was really quick and pretty accurate uh, when they performed their skills. And they used sport-related skills as opposed to laboratory pencil moving or light uh, button kind of touching skills. So the explicit side of this is where everybody goes home happy and smiling. They passed eight balls, they got coached, that, all this kind of stuff. Usually that's the kind of coaching that goes on in, in clinics and camps, um, but it really doesn't hold very robust into competitive performance. It's okay for sort of the immediate uh, situation right after that, but from a sport performance long term, under pressure, it really doesn't uh, hold up very well. So what we're looking at is getting the athletes to be really aware of what's going on around them and within them to try and make a um, pretty conscious decision about what they should be doing. And uh, Bruce Lee had a quote uh, when they were explaining when he was trying to explain to an interviewer why he was bouncing around and smiling all the time when he fought, and uh, except when he went in for the kill. Um, and his comment back to the interviewer was, um, a lot, "If you've heard the really famous one about be like water and you flow with everything, but his." internal um, central focus was not to think about how to throw a punch but just feel when to throw the punch and where to throw the punch how hard to throw the punch and what part of the body he should hit with that punch on his opponent and not trying to deal with how to mechanically get the punch over there um, so I think this stuff is, is being recorded or copied so you can go through that. Um, but it is, really is a, a different kind of uh, uh, approach to competition um, and performing well under, under pressure. So nitty gritty stuff, kind of. If we are doing skill decisions, in the, on the acquisition side of this, we know that there should be lots of contacts. 
for an athlete to learn during acquisition. They won't all have to be at once, but it's got to be a lot. So there's something learning going on. So a couple suggestions here that from the beginning, whether the kids are eight or 12 or 15, you're always using targets for serving of some kind. You're always working on short long, finding weak passers, um, always. Serve, receive, you're always talking about cutting the ball trajectory. Left or right, short. Uh, if, if you're looking at, you're getting stuck with too many people in the court, um, one of the weakest things you can do for serve reception is have the tosser and, and the target at the same distance away from the passer. So if you're on the same side of the net as the passer, they're past your own goal, about one third of your toss. So if you're at the net, they're on the baseline, that's nine meters, they should be passing a ball only three meters from the baseline. That is, as long as you believe in that relationship and you believe in bunting the ball and you believe in controlling the rebound. Um, otherwise, they'll start swinging. So, I mean, it's really, um, it, it's one of the weaknesses of something like triple ball where there's such an easy ball coming in. It's, it is a free ball. The kid should be able to make a choice to pass underhand or overhand. And one of the worst things we do is throw it right at them. Uh, we should be able to throw it with different spins, different places, under control, and teach them how to move and control that pass. Um, that's a very personal one, but that's okay. Uh, set Setting, start open to the passers, move the ball square. Um, targets off the net, usually around one to a meter and a half, um, et cetera, et cetera. So those in the acquisition stage, that's what you're looking at, at training from the beginning. Attacking how to cut off the trajectory. Blocking how to cut off the hitter pathway. Digging, all you have to do is put yourself in the best place on the court. Uh, so where I learned to find that is find out where our block is. Do we have a block? Don't we have a block? Who's hitting? Uh, and I start watching to put myself in the best place to touch the ball. Uh, one of the things that the Americans are, are high on um, at infinitum is the game teaches the game, um, which is somewhat true. So try and using you know ones, twos, threes, and warmups and in training um, all all the way through uh, your training environments. And then decisions as you go up consolidation, you know that there's going to be some people uh, who are going to be out of uh, under pressure, out of sync with what's going on. So now you, let's say, serve the ball deeper into the side harder, so they have to decide whether they're going overhand or underhand, and where the trajectory is back to the serving target, sorry, passing target. Uh, utilize pass tempo, we'll deal with that one later. Uh, attacking versus a line block versus a cross court block. When do I make the decision to hit, roll, chip, recycle? As a coach, you can be directing what kind of block they see, or it can be random. In the beginning, we're suggesting it's somewhat directed by the coach so that I learn where to send the ball because of what I see. Hmm. Um, as you go through to the game, part of the suggestion, again, from Volleyball Canada is to reward what's going on and what they're working on. So let's say you're working on serve, serve, receive, and so we have a serve, receive, serve, focus, game to seven. Right? You get a bunch of games in. Any ace or perfect pass, and you have to define what a perfect pass is, we're plus two. However, if the inevitable um, two passers back away from the path of the ball that drops the floor, which I keep seeing over and over again, uh, that team loses all their points. So it's not push-ups, it's not burpees, it's, it's, it's volleyball stuff, and it uh, gets some focus about going to the ball. Uh, refinement stage. So that this is part of the LTAD and part of Volleyball Canada um, skill matrix. So you can find this on the, on the, I think it's on the OBA website, and for sure it's on the Volleyball Canada website. 
The stuff in gray, all the gray boxes, are things that were from the previous cycle. So if we're training 15s and 16s, this would have been in the 13, 14 also. And then there's a list of things to look at for curating decision making. Anything in white is possibly something new that you would introduce at this age level. And you can go through for the next uh, two year age bracket, 17, 18, uh, 19, 20, etc. But there's a pretty good um, matrix about what, what should be happening, what things you could be looking at, and things you could build into your drills. Uh, if, if you can't find it, I'm sure LP would be happy to send you the link for that. Um, we go through. So at this stage, we're looking at under all kinds of, in the refinement stage, this is after they know something pretty good. And they, can they can complete it really well. They have to be able to perform under pressure, basically what we're saying. So a couple of simulated play or game type of situations that uh, can put athletes under pressure. Um, starting a game with a serving team up 22-18, and you can do it two ways. You can play it out or you can have the serving team um, only serve until the game's over. So it is a one rotation game only then. So the, the 22 side would serve until the game's over. The 18 side would serve receive till the game's over. Uh, or you can play it out. Uh, starting at 19 all, when a team gets to 23, they must get 24, 25 in a row, or they go back to 19. Starting at zero, uh, lots of teams complain about um, starting matches or finishing matches. You could do this uh, two ways. First team to five gets 21, other team gets 19. Or the first team to five gets 12, and the other team gets 10, and you go to 15. But it's really important in the third and fifth games um, that the teams start and finish. So here again, we'll look at a couple of things. I'll try and hit the button if I can. Um, we're going to look and see if you can feel what's going on and see what's going on. Um, we're looking at the yellow Brazil again. So obviously a, a back set. It's a really interesting defense. Um, but I look at this girl coming behind her that made this blocker probably commit. So that's probably that's a, a feeling kind of her because she wasn't turning her head around. She wasn't peeking over her shoulder. Uh, and it's one of those things, so if that blocker commits to her, then I'm setting outside. Right? Where we saw on the other side, if the blocker committed outside, then I'm setting, you know, inside the gap. It's a pretty decent set, but the defense around it is still pretty good. Again, outside set. And what you find here is that even though the middle blocker was late, um, they both decide not to block. So something happened over here to this attacker that they realized and could see um, that told them not to block, not to jump. That comes from training those kind of situations. And again, they're going outside. So bad news is you're not going to beat Brazil by just sending free balls over. So it was an outstanding set to split the block. She cuts it around, good defense again. Okay, so the question now is, where is she going to set the ball? If we 
look at the contextual things that are happening, it middles out. There's a right side hitter, there's a pipe hitter, and the left side hitter is somewhere behind the hole. Um, this block is committed already. The defense is still pretty high. So again, we're if you can, uh, if you have a chance to do a, a question or, or throw it down, the ball's up here, it's coming down into her hands. She has a back set, she has a pipe, and she has an outside set against this bunch block start. Uh, where do you think that that ball will go? Where do you think that she will set it? You've got half a second to make that decision. So if you can, if you don't hit hit your uh, question thing and just give me a, a guess, unless you've seen the video before, where you think the ball will go? I can read questions, but I can't see any. Um, comments so okay I apologize on this audio stuff but um Set outside and then we'll let it play. And even though the middle block was laid for Brazil, it's an awesome close to seal. So a good decision, even though she was late making the decision, the execution of the block was was outstanding. Um, so, I mean, there's those things too, like how, how much time do you train in system all the time versus out of system? Uh, that block start was not in system, it was out of system. She got beat by the set selection, but she recovered in time to make the a really good execution. Uh, execution skills, is that means the, one of the things that uh, people are experimenting with now is analogy. Um, I thought I was really uh, uh, cute about about some of these analogies, what I found out is, uh, especially for something like serve receiving, uh, with the, the puppy there, 99% of my athletes have never been to a baseball game or seen a baseball game or seen anybody bunt a baseball. So it's really difficult for them to make a connection with a bunting analogy if they haven't done that. Um, they made a way more um, solid connection with the, the silly dog head leaning over to the side like they do when they give you that quizzical look about tilting the table or the platform it's not not your head that one made way more sense to them than the bunt one um, so if you're going to use analogies um, Attack arm swing. We've been trying to get athletes to relax their shoulder and elbow so it's a little bit more neutral and that the palm is facing down or backwards. So one of the ones we came up with was place your cell phone gently on a shelf behind you so you're not throwing it back there and not dropping it. It's nice and gentle and relaxed. Um, looking at setting a tempo to the outside of the court, uh, which may see it like a uh, slow shoot set or a little bit is same arc as an Audi TT. Uh, so all you do is just put that in um, to their books and they can follow this pattern along the roof. That That's the tempo of the set. So it's maybe a meter and a half, a meter, two meters above the net. Um, this was a pretty good example photo of high five the player beside you and then high five the ball for a standing closer. 
So if you're using analogies, they've got to find ones that make sense to the athletes um, and they make sense to uh, the skill that you're trying to uh, develop and also the result of what you're trying to get to happen. And the reason being So again, there's some uh, good studies out as far as what implicit learning and analogy uh, learning and teaching goes, is that analogy, uh, teaching, learning is a more robust type of process to get something across from a sport execution point of view. When it says that, um, you talk about explicit rules the kids that we give all the information to start worrying about all the information. So that's when I go back to, again to the Calvin and Hobbes uh, cartoon. It's too much information. They start worrying about all the little things instead of just bunting the ball or just spiking the ball or just, or just setting the ball. Um, so we can use an analogy to give feedback to and have them catch up to them. External focus is another huge um, direction for coaching, whether it's a setting target, whether it's a hitting target to hit around a block, uh, hit through and over the block. I mean, I think everybody's seen uh, Chris Lawson with his shovels and me with my toboggans and et cetera, et cetera. Um, pool noodles you can use for showing block closes, et cetera, serving, targets, hitting targets. The athletes have to focus externally on what they want to happen, where the ball should go and what they think should be happening with their contact on the ball. When, when you train an athlete with an external focus, it results in greater accuracy and efficiency of movements. And also they found out again, under pressure, the movements are executed faster. They don't um, fall prey to the, the list of things they have to remember. Last thing under uh, execution skills. John Cleese is one of my favorite coaching philosophers. Um, a business group hired him to come to the States and do a business presentation and basically he land based on them because they would always fire the people that are making mistakes and promote the people that were doing pretty uh, useless work just to get them up. Um, but what his suggestion was, especially from a coaching point of view, is that you have a tolerant attitude towards mistakes or a positive attitude. Um, his caveat is as long as they are a possible good try, can't, you know, if you're serving uh, to long one, let's say, and you have a target that, and the athletes are serving under the net to four, that's probably not a great try. So um, what you have to look at is error minimizing learning is really, really, has a really good connection to motor learning in group situations. So like our sport, that would mean that the targets are bigger, the distances are smaller until they get better, but we don't um, change the skill, the whole partness of the, the wholeness of the skill. So the acceptable range of errors, you have to decide how big this range is. So if this is your target, let's say over the net, it's straight up, it's vertical to the ground over the net, and you're trying to serve through the middle into long one, and your athlete is serving over the net into short four, you might be thrilled that it's over the net, but you have to decide whether that's an acceptable error or not. So in the beginning, your range can be huge, uh, but you're the one that decides, probably based on age level, experience level, you're the one that decides that range of errors. And then you try and zero in on it so it gets to where you want it to be. It is a long process. 
um, but it is shown to be beneficial to the athletes as far as com competitive um, as a competitive nature. Sorry. So the last couple of things, previous benefits of decision training uh, were found, but it takes a long time. So decision training versus me telling them what to do is more robust, it's more efficient, but it does take longer. Um, and they learn to read what's going on better. So the ifs and thens, the hows and whys, the what now kinds of situations. So that when it comes time to serving at 24 all, um, you look at your athlete and a big smile on his or her face going, yeah, I know what I'm, I've been here before. I know what I'm doing and uh, I know where I'm going to serve this ball. Uh, some other stuff for you that maybe you've seen before, but if, now that the trials are starting, we're getting our clubs is make sure you go back to this page, uh, look down through your box of where you're at. This happened to be indoor female athletes. Um, and make sure that they're addressing this stuff in your seasonal plan. Once you have your competition set out and how long your season is, uh, you have to figure out where this is all going to be happening, never mind uh, the straight volleyball stuff. So, last kind of um, philosopher that I like. Uh, Michelangelo, apparently on his deathbed, was uh, quoted, misquoted, nobody's quite sure, um, Ancora and Paro, uh, which still I learned, uh, which I thought was a pretty cool uh, statement for somebody that done all he did uh, and was still thinking about learning. So I figure I'm, I can steal part of that. and. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm still learning. Hopefully you guys are all still learning and uh, challenging each other and challenging yourself to steal, steal some stuff, tweak some stuff for you. Because um, the last thing that Bruce Lee said was also um, take everything that is useless and throw it away and keep only the good stuff and then add your own stuff and make it your own. I'm paraphrasing loosely, but it's just, it is not you can't use somebody else's information to um, wholeheartedly, like, you know, and you have to tweak it, make it yours, and then make it, uh, make it work.